、えー、皆様お待たせいたしました、えー、次のセッションに入っていきたいと思います、えー、次のセッションは、えー、セイベスさんによるホームエイジロープをリストプリゼントワークですよろしくお願いします Thank you. Hello,、um, I'm Casey West.、Uh, it's great to be here. I will speak more slowly、uh, than Matt spoke.、Um, so,、uh, I work at Pivotal,、uh, I work on Cloud Foundry.、Uh, it's important that I say that. <laughs> Um, so, this talk is about、uh, Conway's Law and about working remotely or working on a distributed team. And if you're not familiar with Conway's Law,、um, it's that organizations will design systems which copy their communication structures.、Um, with that in mind,、um, I've,、uh, I've been working on an idea、uh, that I call durable communication or、uh, collaboration using deliberately inclusive. Transparent and reliable tools and techniques.、Um, I've been working remotely for a while, and it takes an amount of effort to do it well.、Um, once you've given in to the idea that you need to spend your time、um, communicating effectively as the primary、uh, concern when you're working remotely,、uh, then you can do it pretty well.、Uh, the concept is inspired by data storage,、uh, the idea that you know, usually you have either Uh, durable or permanent storage or ephemeral storage.、Um, and people say that it's harder to work remotely、uh, than not, and、uh, that can be true in the outset, but I don't believe that it's true、um, forever. And so I'd like to discuss a few、uh, tools and a few techniques、uh, to try and ease that burden.、Um, so, why should, why should you care about this? Well, I care about it because I've been working remotely for about Ten、uh, years. Up until very recently, I was leading a few teams in disparate geographic locations and trying to come up with strategies of making it easy and effective to do work、uh, without、uh, an increase in, in the amount of time it takes to accomplish things,、uh, if at all possible.、Uh, I'm curious in the audience if we could raise our hands、um, who is presently working on a team that is remote,、um, that has remote workers, or is distributed geographically? So, a lot of folks are, are working, working with this problem.、Um, great, that's good. Then, then, this is a good talk for you.、Um, I also want to say that it doesn't work with every culture, every organization to work remotely.、Um, some, some teams and, and some groups like to work、uh, very closely in a physical location, and that's okay.、Um, if that's you, then you may be at the wrong talk unless you want to、uh, maybe try to change your organization. Um, the, the primary thing that I want to talk about is that effective communication saves time.、Um, when you're working remotely, your communication has to be more deliberate and more intentional、uh, than when you're just at the office. When you're at the office, you can have、um, accidental communication.、Uh, we call that、um, conversation at the water cooler or in the kitchen or over lunch. And all of those things are good, but it's important to capture. The information shared, the knowledge gained,、uh, the ideas that were had. And,、uh, you know, if you want to succeed at remote work,、um, there will be deliberate changes in the way your team communicates if you're not work remote right now.、Uh, it's a conscious choice, and it's an alter altering of the behaviors and the culture to better suit,、uh, suit a distributed group of people.、Uh, so I believe that、uh, working effectively. Uh, remotely or in distributed teams is, an, is a skill that can be acquired and it can be worked on. And if you, if you do put time into that, then it will save everyone、uh, time in the long run and energy.、Um, one of the key differences of、uh, working remotely and、uh, making communication and effective communication a top priority is that your team will be more transparent. You'll share more information. Uh, more often than you might otherwise, and you'll do it in a way that can be searched and indexed and recorded, and we'll talk about some, some tools、uh, to do that soon.、Um, <clears throat> it, this is important because、uh, when you're working on a, on a software project,、uh, 
you'll know that over the course of, say, several years, decisions will be made, and if those decisions are lost, then you won't understand why uh, the code is in the state that it's in. Um, a common example that I run across a lot are um, Boolean values that don't seem like they should be uh, Boolean. They, they were designed in the code base uh, to have multiple values. Maybe in the database there's an enum, uh, and that enum data store uh, has yes and no, or on or off. And you wonder why, why'd you do that instead of a regular Boolean? And this is where it can be really important to make sure that you capture the information uh, that was transferred at the time those decisions were made. You might find out that the project ran out of time and you had to, uh, you had to make some strange decisions that, that in retrospect seem, uh, seem really strange. Um, so I think uh, one of the keys here is that there's a shared responsibility to making this communication work well. Um, your organization has a responsibility to provide you the tools to enable you to work effectively as a distributed team or as a remote worker. Um, your team has the responsibility uh, to challenge each other to make sure that you're sharing and that the communication lines are open. And you have your own responsibility of advocating uh, for yourself, especially if you are remote in a, in a team, to make sure that you're included in conversations and that uh, things aren't happening in uh, communication areas that you can't see, like the water cooler or the kitchen. Uh, and when those, when those conversations are had, that you bring them back into a place where everyone can see them. Um, if you're working in a company that isn't remote right now, uh, and would like to be, or perhaps uh, you want to remain at your company but move to another location, uh, you will have to go through a change process in the way that your team communicates and collaborates together. There is no doubt that that is difficult. It doesn't always work. Uh, I will say that, you know, although it's not effortless, um, when uh, durable communication is um, fully embraced, it'll get better, and the transition uh, may be challenging, but the outcomes are uh, much better. They're in the right direction. Uh, so you'll spend some energy, you'll spend some effort to uh, work with your team and work with your organization to uh, bring conversations out into a, an open place where you can see them no matter where you are in the world. Uh, but that effort is well spent. So. I'm going to talk about some tools that I've used uh, and that folks I know have used to great success uh, to work remotely and collaborate well. Um, some of them are free, some of them are uh, paid, and this is not an endorsement, so you should do your own cost-benefit analysis between them, but, um, but I believe that these tools would work well. And they're particularly tailored toward uh, software engineers. Uh, since most of us are building or delivering software. Um, the first one is, is probably the most obvious. It's a way to uh, have ongoing asynchronous text chat. Um, there are four primary aspects that you need to have in a text chat service. I don't think you can uh, do very well in your, in your remote collaboration without them. Um, one is to have an archive that is indexed and searchable. Uh, you need to be able to, uh, to see the conversations that have happened in the past. Um, you have to be able to spin up a group chat uh, to uh, be able to create new groups uh, as you see fit and communicate with your team and your teams uh, effectively. You need to be able to private chat, uh, communicate with an individual on your team at, at any time and ideally that can be uh, fully private so you can have communication uh, just with two, two people. And full participation is important as well. Everyone that's involved in whatever you do, uh, what we do is building software, they need to be involved in this process. Uh, so some tools that work well for this uh, are Slack, uh, HipChat, IRC, or Google Hangouts. Um, can I get a show of hands who's using these tools? So just about everybody, that's great. That's great. I haven't taught you anything new. Um, so ChatOps is um, 
is a wonderful world of uh, building robots to do whatever it is you want them to do. Um, I think uh, chat ops is another great way to increase collaboration in your team. Um, first of all, it can be fun. Uh, a lot of folks give talks about uh, chat ops where they describe using bots like uh, Lita or Hubot, uh, written in whichever programming language you prefer there. Um, they give talks about you know, automatically deploying software, um, uh, getting information from your continuous integration servers, uh, and that's all great, and you should do that. Uh, but I think it's even better uh, to use these bots to make sure that you can easily find and uh, put animated GIFs into uh, your text chat um, and any other image that you need. Uh, you know, look stuff up on the internet, uh, remember facts and information, and a lot of these tools do that. And the reason for that is part of working remotely is that you need to be able to uh, have a little bit of fun. Uh, when you're working in an office, you get to know people, you get to make jokes, um, you know, over the cubicle wall uh, or at lunch, and you sometimes miss that when you're working from home uh, or working from another office. So I think it's important to have a little bot. And it's also nice because if you allow anyone to contribute, then everyone can participate in making it better. And these bots are both very easy to add new plugins to and new functionality to. Um, so audio video communication. This one, I, I've actually had more challenges than you might expect with this. Um, first of all, you know, it's very important to have headphones to be able to take an audio call or a video chat. Um, it's very important to have a good microphone. Your laptop has a good microphone. Um, I have that giant microphone uh, at, at my home office and I love it. It's ridiculous, but it's fun. Uh, and you do need to have a good camera. Um, some, I know a lot of folks that try to do uh, calls remotely without headphones and that can be very challenging, especially if you have teams that are distributed in different offices. You don't necessarily want to take a call at your desk where everyone else can hear it. Uh, and then you, you, do, you also can't always get a conference room uh, to have a private conversation there. So I recommend always having headphones with you. Um, so some good uh, audio video communication tools. Uh, HipChat has a good plugin. It, it is paid, uh, but you can do video and you can do audio. Um, Google Hangouts is good. Uh, Appear.in is a website that I recently used and found it to be pretty nice. Um, there's a company called Buffer, which is completely remote. And they like Squiggle as well. Uh, so I, I would like, I am curious who is using any of these tools to do audio or video chat? Just some, okay. That's okay. Screen sharing. Uh, so I, I need to start this off by asking who does pair programming or collaborative programming now at, at work? Okay, some. Um, when you're, when you're remote, I found that it's really nice to be able to quickly be able to collaborate if you're having a problem or you need help from uh, IT on setting up your computer or, um, or you just wanna go over some ideas. Screen sharing is really beneficial. Um, so it is important to be able to do that. Uh, again, here are some quick uh, tools like Screen Hero, HipChat, Join Me, and WebEx. Um, the important thing here for these tools, and it goes for audio video calls as well, is that you need to be able to do one-on-one -on -one sharing and group sharing, and uh, whichever tool you choose, you need to be able to get a video call or a screen share happening uh, within a minute. The longer delay that it takes, the more paperwork or process you have to go through, uh, the less likely you are to to collaborate this way, and it really does hinder your ability to uh, work closely with your team. So um, some development tools, uh, since we were doing development, uh, I, I always uh, want to use an opportunity like this to talk about uh, commit messages. Um, commit messages are critically important to write well. Um, so I'm curious, uh, how many, how many of you have had a conversation at work about commit messages and writing them well? Yeah, a few. So 
so I have, um, I, I tend to be uh, very serious about good commit messages, and I equate having good commit messages to being able to um, know exactly where to look for artifacts if you're an archeologist. Um, if you are new to a code base and it has an excellent commit history, you'll be able to look back in time and see what has happened and see why. And the why is even more important because while you can read the changes in the code, uh, if you don't have an explanation of what, what, what that programmer was thinking, and sometimes that programmer is you, uh, then uh, you may feel a bit lost. You may not understand why you have an enumeration field that only has yes or no. You know, but if you have an explanation as to why, that can go a long way. Um, I think uh, Adam Savage from Mythbusters, which is an American TV show, uh, says it best. He says, you know, the only difference between science and screwing around is writing it down. And so, uh, this is, this is what I think about commit messages, and I think it's critically important, especially when you're not uh, co-located with your team and you need to be able to understand why yesterday in some strange time zone a change was made. Code review as well. Um, so we all have a development process. Um, can we raise our hands if code review is a part of that development process? Some, some again. Uh, Code review uh, is, uh, folks have done research and suggest that while uh, unit testing and integration testing and functional testing alleviate defects in software uh, to a reasonable percentage, somewhere around 25 to 33%, uh, you can get as high as 60% defect detection rate and mitigation through code reviews. Um, the book Code Complete uh, details it nicely, and I would recommend that book if you're interested in reading it. Um, so code review is an excellent way of uh, detecting defects in addition to your testing that you do on a regular basis. Um, uh, it, it is true that code review takes time and a lot of the reason why teams will avoid code review is because uh, it can slow you down. And the idea is if you're spending perhaps a day or two on some feedback and back and forth on code review, and changes based on uh, reviewer comment, that uh, that's slowing down your ability to ship. But I would argue that because it does such an excellent job of uh, defect detection and uh, sharing knowledge, and it's another way to collaborate, um, over time it can definitely speed you up. Because if you start introducing defects into your software, it will take more time to change it over, uh, over the course of its lifetime and those modifications are additionally costly if you're working around defects that could have been caught through code review. So I recommend trying code review, please. Um, so pull requests uh, are available both in um, uh, GitHub and uh, GitLab. I, uh, I think it's a pretty excellent model. Uh, it is the model that a lot of open source software uses, so it would be very familiar to you if you happen to have any of those tools available. Uh, Garrett is uh, <laughs> Garrett is a code review tool that some people love and some people do not, but it but it, it exists. Uh, and Review Board and Code Collaborator are in similar boats. So uh, I'm using a generic term here, digital progress board. Uh, I prefer uh, Kanban style software development as my agility methodology of choice. Um, but if you do Scrum or XP or any other type of software development, you probably have some sort of tracker that you use to understand the work in progress, um, what's in the queue to be worked on after that, and of course what's on its way to completion. Um, some teams uh, like to do this on sticky notes, on whiteboards, and that works very well if you are in one room but it does not work as well uh, if you're working remotely. And I think uh, most folks probably do have some digital version of this. I didn't include JIRA in the list because I don't like it. But I did include Pivotal Tracker, Trello, 
GitHub issues. Um, I've seen uh, a couple of teams using waffle.io on top of GitHub issues, and it, it's quite beautiful, and I think it, it seems to work very well. I haven't used it personally, but I would give it a try if you want to use GitHub issues as more of an agile workflow process tool. Um, collaborative writing, this is one that, that I see overlooked a fair amount. Um, collaborative writing is particularly beneficial if you do have a lot of meetings. Um, if you have a lot of meetings and you need to take notes, it can be a great way to save time uh, to do that collaboratively. And collaborative editing tools or collaborative writing tools will allow you to write and uh, as you change the document, everyone can see those changes and they can contribute as well. Uh, Etherpad is a, a pretty good tool for this. You can run it, it's fully open source and you can run it locally. Um, I've had great success just spinning up a Docker container uh, for Etherpad and that seems to work well. Uh, it does not store anything long term, but it isn't really meant to. The idea is to write in a tool like this and then store it elsewhere. Um, Hackpad is similar to that. Now Google Docs and GitHub Wiki, um, Google Docs will allow you to see live edits and the GitHub Wiki will not. Uh, so that is a limitation, but it is also, uh, as a wiki, a way to collaboratively write and share information. Um, but if you haven't tried something like uh, taking notes as a team, as a group, it's a really excellent exercise. I would recommend it. Uh, oftentimes you can uh, ask for a volunteer or designate one or two individuals uh, to write down notes as they, as they see fit. They may have grammatical errors or uh, spelling errors, but what's nice is that the rest of the team can come in and clean that up after them and also make it a little more structured, maybe organize that information a little better. And uh, that's a nice uh, team strategy for getting on the same page, especially uh, in meetings. Um, file storage, uh, a lot of folks have some sort of shared drive. Um, I recommend that companies do this. Uh, in, in my last company, we had an NFS server that was very hard to use, but it is a possibility. Um, I'm using Google Drive at Pivotal right now. It's working out very well. Uh, Dropbox and, and Box.net are also good examples. Uh, we probably don't have to go too much into that, but it's also, it's particularly good for sharing large files. So. If you're in the business of uh, making uh, large images, such as uh, OVAs, uh, that you need to pass around, uh, it might be a good, good thing to do uh, to use uh, file storage, that you can share that with the entire team. And it's nice that everyone would be able to have access to it. Um, or if you make movies, perhaps, demos, that kind of thing. Uh, and then shared calendars. And this one is challenging, because I think it's so important uh, there are only a few options that I'm aware of, and I, I would accept feedback on uh, additional choices if they exist. Um, but it's, it's really helpful. Uh, obviously, one of the difficulties of remote work is scheduling things like meetings. And it's nice if you can see someone's calendar, at least see when they are busy and when they're free. Um, it, it's a really good way to be able to understand uh, how, to, how to schedule your time especially if you have time zone differences. Uh, in America, we only have three time zones, but if you're working uh, with people that are even further away, um, you, need, you may only have a few hours of overlap, and, you want, and it's good to be able to do that automatically without having to send a bunch of emails. Um, so I like Google Calendar for that. Uh, Exchange is kind of a default in a lot of large organizations. Um, and like I said, I would accept uh, any input as to uh, other options. And finally, uh, and I mentioned it last, email. Uh, I actually feel that email is not a good tool for collaboration. It is a good tool for um, getting notifications or doing uh, asynchronous communication that is not time sensitive. Um, so in that way, if you send an email, especially if you're working remotely, it's a good idea not to expect it to get answered immediately and maybe use some other technique, the text chat, option is, is pretty good. So uh, I don't want to go too much further into email, but when it comes to remote collaboration and working together, especially uh, on development teams, I don't think it serves us as well as a lot of other options. 
So let's go over uh, a few techniques uh, for how to introduce change and, and cultivate change if you're trying to go from uh, working in a very co-located way to working remotely. And here are a few things that, that I've tried that I think work pretty well. So everyone should experience remote work. Um, I would recommend a full week uh, where even if you, if you have a central office and most people work there, for that week, ask a few folks, or maybe even everyone, uh, to work remotely away from the office. And one of the reasons for this is really empathy. If you have remote workers, it can be difficult to understand uh, how to include them if you haven't experienced the, uh, the challenges that go with working remotely yourself. And a great way to understand that and, uh, and maybe make some changes is to have everyone work remotely. Um, so that may mean uh, asking people to work from home. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's a good thing to do. Uh, not everyone can work from home all of the time. Uh, I'm a father of three children. Working from home is problematic at best, but you can ask them to work from perhaps a co-working space or uh, a coffee shop if they don't mind drinking a lot of coffee. To, um, to make it fair that they're gonna sit at the coffee shop for 10 hours. Uh, or um, another option that you could explore if uh, folks still need to, if people still need to come into the office, uh, rather than working from home or from a, a third space, is blocking off some conference rooms which can be remote places where people can pretend to be remote. Uh, and the trick there is to not cheat. Don't run over to that conference room and, and talk to somebody. Try to use you know, your remote collaboration tools. Um, on the other side of, of this is that you should have on-site meetups. Um, your remote workers uh, should come together with the rest of your team. Your te whole team should come together on a fairly regular basis. This is the thing that I think is probably most overlooked in a lot of organizations where uh, if you're a remote worker, it can be very beneficial to your company if they don't have to pay for uh, office space for you inside of the office, and that's very nice for them. Uh, but it's still important for them to bring you into the office occasionally. Uh, it can be very difficult to remember uh, when you're having heated debate and uh, critical conversation that is always professional, I'm sure. It can be very difficult to remember that there's a human being on the other side. Uh, if you don't see their face, if you don't know what they laugh at and what they find you know, good or bad, it can be a real challenge to communicate with them. So it's very important to get into the office if you're remote or bring people in and get them to know each other. Uh, I worked with someone at a company uh, many years ago. It was a collaboration company uh, called Social Text. And the CTO of that company uh, would get all of the developers into um, the San Francisco Bay Area. We were a remote company. All the developers were remote. And he would say to us when we got into the office for that week uh, that it, FaceTime, which is you know, being together and looking each other in the face, FaceTime is too important uh, to waste on work. So when you do have on-site meetups, it's important to spend that time just getting to know each other. Um, go out to lunch, uh, do planning sessions. Planning sessions are very good for, uh, for on-site meetups. Um, but don't, um, don't go heads down into the keyboard and just hack away, but from the office, if you don't go to the office very often. Instead, you know, look up, meet your coworkers, and get to know people. So uh, Inviting remote workers into the hallway conversation is very important. This is also very challenging. Um, it's always going to happen that you will have organic conversation in the office. You're going to turn to your coworker because you have an idea and you're very excited and you're gonna tell them about this idea and that's gonna be great. When you do have remote workers or when you're working remotely, um, especially if, if you are remote from the office, when you have that great idea, you can't just turn to anyone and talk about it. You have to you know, go to your text chat or you know, get somebody on the phone, um, you know, make a video or something. Uh, so it's important when you're, if you are in the office and you are co-located with a team that if you have remote workers, you include them in conversations that you're having around the office. So this is where being mindful and being deliberate really comes into play. 
you may have to stop your conversation for a moment and say, you know, our remote teammate would be very interested in this. Let's start a video chat and discuss it together. Uh, and that will take a little getting used to. It may make you feel uh, a little less enthusiastic initially, um, but it'll be worth it because you'll be including someone who might be interested, you'll be sharing information, and it'll make the conversation better. Over-communicate. So, um, uh, over-communication uh, is, I think, hard to do in, in a work context when you're collaborating on, uh, on a software project. Um, we communicate constantly through commit messages and code reviews and text chat and email uh, and so on and so on. So it's important to be sharing information constantly. Um, but when you have a distributed team, it's especially important to communicate your ideas and your thoughts on a regular basis. Uh, it may seem strange to commit to writing them down uh, and to commit to writing down your ideas and communicating them uh, more consistently, but uh, I think it's important to remember that when you're working out of an office, uh, you are communicating uh, oftentimes without even realizing it when you're walking to lunch or uh, you know, after work on the way to the train, you may be you may be chatting with a coworker and just bouncing ideas off of off of that coworker, and uh, and that's happening all the time. But when you have remote folks, you know they can't hear that, or you might think of something but not mention it out loud. So it's important to write it down. Uh, you don't necessarily have to talk at someone all the time, uh, you know, with your voice, but at least uh, write it down in text chat and communicate that way. So sharing your personality is also really important. This goes back to when you're on site, it's too important to do regular work. Uh, make sure that uh, through textual communication and through phone calls and video chats that you are sharing your personality. Uh, it, it's important because that helps your coworkers who might not see you every day understand a little bit more about who you are, how you respond to feedback, how you respond to criticism, how you respond to good ideas and bad ideas. Uh, and uh, if you're sharing your personality, then, they, uh, then your other coworkers can feel as though they know you a little better. Uh, so I would recommend um, uh, letting folks know uh, what you're interested in, what you're doing for fun. If you're leaving the office for the day, you know, maybe you're going to the skateboard park or uh, to the coffee shop for you know, very delicious coffee or to Disney World, and you know, let, let folks know what you're into. Uh, that can be really helpful. Um, another way to share your personality so that it doesn't distract too much from ongoing work is in your text chat, whether it's hip chat or Slack or maybe Google Hangouts, um, having some sort of an off-topic area where you can discuss things that have nothing to do with your actual work can be very beneficial or you may have many of them. Uh, I know that uh, I always have a general random off topic and something related to music because people want to drop links to YouTube videos or you know, uh, other music that they like. And so that's really nice to have. So exhibiting a visible pulse. Uh, I had to learn this one the hard way. Uh, my first remote job uh, that I had full, where I was full-time remote. Uh, I was still uh, very daily, I was programming Perl, I was writing a lot of modules related to email and I apologize to all of you for that. Uh, those are on CPAN, but I think Rick, <laughs> Rick has taken over maintaining most of them and, and curses me constantly, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, but I was spending a lot of my time doing that and I was having a lot of fun and I was getting a lot of value out of it. Uh, and actually, most of it was related to my work. Um, for better or worse, I was trying to write an email server in Perl using Poe, and, and you know, I had a lot of bad ideas at the time. But, uh, but I also um, did something that people refer to as going dark. I sort of disappeared uh, from work for a while because I was working on the, the software and I was really enjoying it. Uh, and it was also very challenging and I was constantly getting behind. And, and then I got nervous about being behind and then 
Uh, then I stopped showing up to uh, stand-ups and daily conversations with my coworkers, and then they sent me a letter that said that I probably am not working for the company anymore, uh, and then I wasn't working for the company anymore. So, uh, so I learned the hard way to uh, make sure that if you are remote, you have to let people know what you're doing. You have to let them know that you're there, that you're alive, and that you're okay. Um, this isn't so much about uh, keeping track of a human being and, and monitoring their every move. Certainly your coworkers don't care necessarily exactly when you get into the office or, um, or every time you go and get a cup of coffee or tea, but I would tell them anyway, uh, just so that they know your general habits and they get to know uh, a little bit more about your personality. And it's good for people to know when you're there and when you're not there and to get a sense of when those patterns are. So. Um, visible pulse is like your heart rate, and it's good to know that someone has a heart rate and that they're okay. So be sure to share that if you're working remotely. Um, pick a time zone. Um, in uh, several companies that I work for, we've called the standard operating time. Uh, that may be Pacific uh, in the US, um, Pacific Standard. Um, that may be Eastern in the US for me and maybe uh, Japan time, but it's important to pick a time zone that is your default time zone. Um, a lot of the collaboration you're doing uh, may end up being meeting oriented, and if you do have individuals in different time zones, it can be very challenging to try to schedule a meeting and articulate every time zone that needs to be accounted for. If everyone can synchronize to a standard time zone, that works better. If you have a central office somewhere, I would recommend picking that time zone. And um, uh, so what happens here is that the folks who are not in that time zone start to do the math very quickly in their heads, and then they know I'm three hours away or eight hours away from that time zone. And it makes it a lot easier, and it makes the communication a little tighter when it comes to scheduling things. So those are techniques. So um, I want to kind of tie it all together with a few, a few higher level things. There's a, a concept of socio-technical systems, uh, which is derived from socio-technical theory. And the idea there is that any system is the combination of its social components and its technical components. And so we all uh, are probably building software and delivering software. Uh, making these applications. And socio-technical theory would suggest that these applications are the combination of the culture and the well-being of the people that are making it and um, the processes and the software itself as a technical concept. So um, we may have many uh, layers of socio-technical systems within our organizations, within the software that we create, but I do think it's all tied together. Uh, I think I have a slide to describe that, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's this joint optimization. It's the idea that the well-being of the people who are making uh, a system is just as important as the system itself and how it operates. So uh, with that in mind, I think it's important uh, if you're going to do remote work, if you're going to have distributed teams, to make sure that you are deliberate in your communication, that you really are investing time in being better at collaboration remotely, um, making sure that there's an evolution of your culture and your processes and your tool, as well as your tools and, and, um, and your software itself. Um, so uh, just to kind of round it up, um, there are social aspects of of collaborating and working remotely, and there are a lot of ways of making that happen, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, things to empower you uh, to work well remotely. And uh, there are uh, technical aspects to doing this work, um, and this is how I group them together. Uh, but this is sort of the roundup of what we discussed. And then uh, everyone who talks about remote work always talks about cap theorem, so I have to talk about cap theorem. So there, and, and this is how I want to talk about it. There are some limitations to working remotely. Um, so uh, I think it can work very well. Again, there is um, 
there is some overhead, some additional cost in going from a co-located team to a remote team. Um, but uh, the CAP theorem uh, states that it's impossible for a distributed computer system uh, to sim simultaneously provide all three of these guarantees of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And so I would argue that in your distributed team, uh, this follows as well the same way that it does in a distributed system. Um, so you can pick any two. So consistency being, you know, all nodes seeing the same data at the same time. And if we replace nodes with people, uh, that is, uh, that's exactly um, a problem that remote teams have. Um, you, can, uh, you can have consistency, um, or, uh, or you can try to, uh, try to do away with it. Um, and we'll talk about some of these trade-offs in a moment. Uh, availability, that every request sees a response about success or failure. Um, this is a problem that teams have as well. If you ask questions, if you send out pull requests, if you send out emails, um, are you even going to receive a response? Will you receive a response in a timely fashion? Uh, and then partition tolerance, the system that a system continues to operate despite arbitrary part partitioning or network failure. Um, so uh, arbitrary partitioning, of course, being uh, any form of, of distributed or remote work in, the, in this case. So, if you can only pick two of these, because you can't really have three according to CAP theorem, uh, you may have to make some trade-offs. And those trade-offs may be a slight sacrifice in, um, in some measure of efficiency for your team. Uh, maybe you will not have high availability, um, but you will have consistency and you will have partition tolerance. Uh, that's closer to a co-located team. Um, but you may forego consistency, where not everyone has all of the same information all of the time, uh, in order to increase the availability for your team, uh, the ability for them to respond quickly to things, uh, and the ability to um, work even in the case of partition failure. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Too many things. Okay, hang on. I don't know which hand to use for forks either. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so in any case, uh, there are trade-offs that you may have to make. So uh, that kind of, again, goes back to Conway's Law, which is where we started, um, that any organization will produce uh, designs or software in our case. Um, which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. Uh, so if you, the, I always say, uh, if you're building distributed systems, then you should have distributed teams. I think uh, it sort of forces you to think along these models. It forces your culture and your processes to model exactly what you want in your, in your application. And a lot of us these days are doing this. Um, just to sort of uh, wrap it up here. Uh, the health and quality of your product will be a direct reflection of the health and quality of your organization. So this goes back to the socio-technical theory, the idea that the well-being of your people is just as important to the success of your software as the well-being of, of the software itself. So I suggest uh, take great care of your organization and it will pay off in, in your product. Um, so thank you. Uh, Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get to use all the microphones. Okay. Uh, can I ask why you don't want yes. to Or if you want me to have a single product, please share a lot of your <laughs> and I ask this because I know some open source projects are already adapting it for their EC trucking, mostly from Apache as far as I know. So mm -hmm. I thought it, it is 
acceptable for most engineers. So, please. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, uh, I have to take this out of my ear if I'm not getting a Japanese question. Please ask a question in Japanese because I want to be in the future. Um, so, so your question was, uh, uh, why do I dislike Jira? A lot of open source projects are starting to adopt it. Uh, that is a great question. So uh, I've been using Jira for many, many years. Uh, I, if I come into a new organization, chances are they're using Jira. I am happy to say that my, my current organization doesn't. And so here is, here is my gripe, and it actually has nothing to do with the default product of Jira. It has everything to do with administering Jira. So uh, my issue is that if you run the uh, downloadable version of Jira that you run on your own, uh, chances are your administrator will uh, configure and tweak every single option that they can possibly tweak. And the thing about Jira is uh, it is a workflow tool that is extremely malleable. You can change it in almost any way and you can change all of the workflows. You can add fields of any variety and in my experience, uh, Jira administrators cannot help themselves but to change and add everything. Um, what happens then is uh, the JIRA instances that I'm familiar with are actually quite brittle and difficult to work with and it can often inhibit the developer workflow. Uh, and so that is my experience. Now, I have had one occasion to use hosted JIRA that is managed by Confluence as a software as a service and it is excellent because it forces you to not be able to change everything under the sun. And that is really wonderful. So that, that's my feedback on JIRA. So if you are going to run JIRA, please don't change very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great question. So the question is, um, when you're doing remote work, uh, there is a tendency to overwork and to get very passionate and to forget to stop working. Uh, that is true. Um, I fall victim to that problem. Uh, I get very excited about the work I'm doing and I uh, go all in and then my, my family and my loved ones, they miss me very much, I think. Um, <laughs> I like to believe. Uh, so do I have any recommendations <laughs> to uh, avoid that? I, I do. Um, you have to be strict with yourself about your schedule. Uh, I also feel that when we talk about shared responsibility, that your organization and your team and yourself all have uh, specific responsibilities about making remote work successful. Uh, it's your responsibility to do your best to manage your own time. Leave the office at a set time uh, or, or you know, at a point when you're actually tired and rest and exercise and eat and eat well uh, that is your responsibility. I think it is fair and reasonable for your team uh, to take opportunity to uh, let you know that it's time for you to leave the office uh, because you've worked too much. Um, someone that, that I worked with very recently, Mary Lou Lenhart is here. She, she's giving a talk later on uh, posture, which is also very good. Uh, we worked together and uh, the team that we worked on definitely let me know that it was time for me to leave the office and take some time off, and sometimes I listen to them. Uh, so I think it's reasonable for your team to do that. Now, your organization has a responsibility as well, which is to not burden you with too much work. There is a lot of value in having what is referred to as slack in your work schedule. You should be able to take time uh, and think and contemplate the work you're doing and be uh, 
and, and have perspective and share your ideas and, and not be burdened with task after task. Uh, and that, that's important. So I feel that it is a shared responsibility. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you just have to go home. Um, you recommended uh, collaboration tools that are hosted like uh, GitHub, Dropbox, Google, Canada. Um, do you and your management trust these companies not to read your business data or confidential data? Great question. Do, did I or, or our management uh, trust the companies that we use with hosted tools uh, to not read our data? Um, my most recent company uh, was in the security industry, so that was very important to us. Um, we used GitHub Enterprise, which we managed uh, in our own data center. Uh, we used uh, Jira, <laughs> that we managed in our own data center. Uh, now, we, we also, in that company, used HipChat, and that was a source of, of a little bit of contention, and we really had to think about that. Um, HipChat has some pretty good security policies. Um, at, at the time that I had researched them, uh, one of the things that they did not do was encrypt your historical chat conversations when they were at rest on disk, which was in, in Amazon's S3 system. So. Uh, so that was a bit of a concern. Uh, and we had to make a policy that we would not share any, uh, any sensitive information, any customer client sensitive data, or any sensitive data about our operating, our production systems uh, in that environment. So we had to make some trade-offs. Uh, but we got a lot of benefit out of using HipChat. It, it increased our ability to collaborate, especially remotely. So it was worth it to have those trade-offs, but we did have to be uh, considered about it. Um, so it is important to, to be careful about that. Your security profile may be different uh, for every situation. So um, there's a concept of situational awareness where you have to understand what your threats are and uh, make smart decisions based on your potential for, th for, um, uh, for being uh, targeted either by those companies or other agents. Yeah. <laughs> Because I, I find that to be like, you start to do both. Right. Um, not, not typically. So my model, uh, my preferred model for pair programming is uh, to use it very selectively. Um, uh, when, uh, when an engineer is getting into, tr into trouble figuring out a solution or uh, needs to uh, talk through some implementation ideas, I think it's nice to pair. And that can be, you know, sometimes five minutes or sometimes an hour. Um, I, I don't personally enjoy, and I haven't met very many programmers that, very, that enjoy programming for eight hours a day, um, pair programming for eight hours a day. Uh, so I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Now, um, somewhat recently, I joined this company, Pivotal, and Pivotal has a consulting arm that we call Pivotal Labs, and Pivotal Labs is 100% pair programming. And uh, they do code review for uh, some situations, but not all, and it's selective. So the idea is that if you have a pair and they're signing off on your work, chances are um, there's reasonable shared understanding. But if for any reason they feel that they need additional, uh, additional eyes looking at the problem, then they will request them. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's very important to be uh, careful and make decisions based on your context. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so the question is uh, related to time zones and uh, it can be very challenging to uh, work collaboratively when you span many time zones. Uh, so I, I would agree with that. There are several methods of uh, remote work or distributed teams that can work well. Uh, one of them is, that, is to have pockets of programmers in different cities. That's, uh, one of, that's Pivotal's method, actually. Uh, we have offices uh, all over the place. Um, we have an office in Japan that is very small, and I intend to visit them on Monday, but I should also tell them that I'm here. So that's important to do. But um, we have pockets of programmers in different cities that have ownership of a particular area of the, of the application. And I think that works out a little better when you're distributed. Uh, and having individuals spread that far out, um, maybe one individual or two that are isolated in a further time zones, that is very challenging, I agree. And do you have any or idea about frequency of in-person meetups? Yes. So would it be um, several times a year or once a year? Or mm -hmm. what? That's a great question. So the question is, uh, what, are, what frequency of on-site or in-person meetups would I recommend? Uh, once a quarter is a minimum, so once every three months feels right to me uh, based on on my experience, that's a good time to get into the office to do uh, planning in person. You've actually reminded me of a whole area of my talk that I forgot to talk about, uh, which is, you know, what should you do whenever you, you get on site? Uh, there are two things that are very challenging to do remotely. Um, one of them is uh, build relationships with your coworkers. And that's why it's so important to not just be uh, buried in your code if you come on site, if you work remotely. Uh, the other one is planning. Planning is very challenging, especially big picture planning, long-term planning. So I feel like once a quarter is a good time to come into the office and have some uh, big picture discussions, maybe some more challenging uh, feedback about direction. Uh, you can do it more, you could do it less, but once a quarter has always been good for me. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'd like to ask, it's somewhat related to the other guy's question. Uh, it's about language. Uh, in particular, in particular case, uh, we have a team that's uh, English, and then we have some teams that are Japanese, and then maybe later on we have like a Venetian or Indian. So, what would you suggest as a way for us to communicate effectively? Would we learn a single language, standardize a single language, or would we learn just mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, how do you handle uh, teams that, are, that have multiple uh, native languages and may not necessarily uh, speak or, or read each other's language? Um, I, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, that's one area that I haven't gotten into. I have worked with teams that are remote in other countries and we standardize on English. Uh, I'm from, from America, so I worked primarily for American companies and that's what we have done. Uh, so my recommendation based only on my relevant experience is that you should standardize on a language. Uh, I understand that that, uh, that may be challenging and I haven't experienced a multilingual office myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the question is, uh, um, so smartphones are a very easy way to stay, uh, stay in touch with your team, to get notifications about things that are happening. Uh, and also, uh, when you're away from the office, 
uh, because you learned how to, how to leave work on time or when you're on vacation. They can also be a great way to keep up with your team and what would I recommend. Um, so this is again where I have to admit that I like to keep up with what's going on even when I'm on holiday uh, or when, uh, when I'm supposed to be sleeping. Uh, so I think that, again, you have to be careful uh, about uh, your commitment level there. Uh, it's important to, um, to put that away sometimes. So while I agree that when you are working, uh, if you're on the train to work and you want to read your email or understand you know, what's going on, or, uh, or even if you are on vacation but you want to stay in touch, it can be a very beneficial thing. Um, but it can also be... Uh, in my experience, very frustrating to your friends and family when you can't uh, stop looking at your phone and you should be enjoying a holiday. So <laughs> again, it's context, be, be careful. Thank you.